And so here we are with three great panelists. Thanks so much for being here for Deloitte Digital. And I'm going to have them all introduce themselves in a moment so you can get a little bit more context and hear a little bit more from directly from them. But first, um, if we want this to work, <laughs> or we just go there. Um, make that makes the question isn't on. Because, you know, the power button is always important. Anyway, and I feel like the same, it's the same case with digital transformation. We'll, we'll refer to it that way because that's what the discussion is about. In mind, what marketers need to do to change their mindset so that they can make everything else happen after that. So, Alan, it sounds, it sounds like you do a lot of work in that area, so why don't you kick us off? So, for marketing specifically, there's, you know, obviously marketing is in a big trans transition right now. I think the days of sort of, you know, shotgun messages and an interruptive model where we interrupt you uh, with a paid message, I think, um, that the world of digital technology has now enabled, as we all know, customers and people and consumers, whatever, whatever humans, whatever you want to call them, to, to skip those messages. So I think for us the challenge now is how do we engage people in a non-interruptive manner, um, in a way that's contextual to what they're doing, and not and, and not in an interruptive way. And I think that what we've come to realize is that. You know, I guess five years ago, the whole branded content, um, if, you, if you've heard that expression, the whole idea of branded content of, of marketers pulling back from interrupting you with a, with, a, with a paid message and actually bookending some type of storytelling content in the form of what, what would be called branded content was sort of all the rage. And I think a trend that we saw very strongly, I think our feeling lately is in sort of what we think the new model is around is sort of this notion of trying to understand and use data to tell us, A, who the customer is, and then use that data to inform us about you know, the behavior of the customer. And uh, no two people are alike, so it creates a very matrixed, complex challenge for us to be able to take in lots of data and determine what the patterns are of human behavior in that data and extrapolate that around defining who the target is, you know, and that comes in the forms of personas and various segments that we would look at. And then going from those personas to the journeys that Ginger mentioned earlier, which is what is the buying path for each one of you? Because each one of you is going to have a different journey. And can we make assumptions about um, things that you will be receptive to either in a consideration mindset in an engagement mindset when you're actually looking to, you know, for a product, product or service information, or if you're a current customer and we're looking to retain you as a customer, you know, what is, what are marketers needing to do to stay front and center in your share of mind? And is that really share of mind? Is it share of voice, all those things we used to talk about in paid media? Or is it about share of culture um, for brands to stay relevant? So I think, I think marketing transformation generally begs that question. I think our approach to that is it pretty much starts with understanding the data about your customer and do you know them? If you don't know them, can you take the data you do have about your customers and can you model that into what we call lookalikes, right? right. Lookalike audiences that can tell you um, the proclivities of, uh, of how the behavior of your customers will, will sort of pattern itself. Then we have to sort of come up with messages from there. Right. So then the mindset change is really, if you're not already a data-driven marketer, you need to be. Yes, I would say that that is very much the truth. Um, and from a creative perspective, the art of persuasion, as we used to call it, I think we have to get comfortable with the fact that we are as much in the science of marketing now as we are in the art of persuasion. That worked really well when people didn't know very much. But um, I think now we're in an age where we have a very, very smart and sharp consumer that you know, just doesn't need to pay attention to us. So I think in this attention economy, if you will, it becomes a matter of do, you have, do we have the data to know who they are and then what are the right contexts within which we can reach them. Right. So along with being data-driven, Scott, any other mindset change recommendations? The funny thing is that I think um, where we are today 
is right back to where the so I think Forrester just called this the age of the customer, which I think is a load of bull. Um, I don't think it's the age of the customer. I think it's the age of the empowered consumer, maybe, where the consumer has more voice and choice. But I don't think we can name eras after what we want them to be. Usually you look back on there and say, well, that was the dark age. That was the industrial age after it's passed. We're in the middle of trying to get back to focusing on the customer. Right? The age of the customer was in the 50s when the milkman came to your door, when the doctor came with a bag to your house. That was when folks knew their customer. Right? And then came the era of big box stores and then the internet, where all of a sudden it was like a sea of customers that you had no idea who they were. And so all you could do was interruptive marketing and just basically just throwing crap against the wall and seeing what stick and the adage of Winnaker or whatever, Wanamaker, is that his name? Um, I told you I was a marketer, right? Um, but, but now we have the data where we can say we're trying to actually get back to being more personal, which we have not been for so long. And so we're trying to actually say we can actually know about those of whom who are receiving our messages. We can know a little bit more about them so that we can tailor our message, actually try to appeal to them in the way that we did in the past. So I think what we've got now is just finally the technology is in a place where we actually can get back to knowing our customers uh, at, at scale, but individually almost. And so the notion of putting that to use so that we can get back to the art that we've always been able to do for a long time, um, or should have been able to do for a long time, is kind of finally upon us. So I, I agree, it's this this transformation. I see it more of a of an evolution than a revolution, uh, but, but definitely, um, kind of that notion of being able to, if, if you can tailor, you need to tailor, right? And so that's kind of where we're at, the expectations are really high from the perspective. It's interesting because you're saying, with that in a nutshell, to be customer-centric, and the best way to be customer-centric today is to be data-driven, so it's interesting how those tie together. Yeah. So, yeah. Michael, how about, how about you? What's the third mindset shift? Well, I, I, I kind of look at this in a more fundamental way. Um, it's less about SQL and non-SQL databases, that's a contributor. It's less about creative, that's a contributor. It's all about perceived value. And it's less about customers, to tell you the truth, than it is about stakeholders. Where is your focus? Where is the perceived value? Uh, where is the culture coming from? Where is the leadership taking it? So, you know, does leadership understand this? What you're endeavoring to do, and this is very clear, is drive increased um, share of customer. Everybody gets that. That's the challenge, that's the mandate, that's the task of not only, not only CMOs or COOs, frankly, everybody within the organization. And when you have companies that understand that, you will have success. Um, one of the paradigms that I follow is T-Bank and what they've been able to do. Everything coalesces around creating internal and external value. Internal value for the employees in order to deliver value to customers. And then using AI, using other forms of you know, digital, digital uh, support to create more value for the customer. We've seen companies do it well. We've seen companies not do it so well. I wrote a column not too long ago about Target. Target is going through a major uh, transformation, or trying to be a transformation um, of their culture, particularly around digital improvement. Great so far as it goes, but there is absolutely no mention of the employee at the store level in what they're endeavoring to do. You don't do that, you have basically what is, they're trying a once and done. It's a tactical transformation. We've seen this kind of thing also uh, among um, uh, some of the ISPs and the, and the uh, cable companies. Uh, there's a reason they're at the bottom of the Temkin ratings. They're at the bottom of, of uh, uh, conference boards evaluations. They're, they're at the bottom of the customer satisfaction index. They haven't been able to pull the culture along with what they're trying to do with employees, what they're trying to do with customers. So they're, you know, you can find models of success. I, I'll give you a quick quote, quote uh, with apologies to Alan, because this comes out of McKinsey. 
This is a study that McKinsey did not too long ago. They said, uh, and this was B2B, B2B sales leaders using digital effectively enjoy five times the growth of their peers who are not at the cutting edge of digital adoption. But a recent McKinsey survey of B2B customers highlighted a more nuanced reality. What customers most desire is great digital interactions and the human touch. Where's that coming from? Coming from employees. And I'd argue that it's not just B2B, you can find this in virtually every industry. So that means that the culture has to go along with it, right? And you have to focus just almost as much on employee experience as you do on customer experience. I've, I've been arguing for years that it's not just customer centricity, it really is stakeholder centricity. And you can find companies that do it well. Zappos are great, they're great. They, you know, they stand out. The Southwest Airlines, you know, 85% of their people are cross-trained in, in supporting customers every year. There's a reason that they do that. It's cultural. So it, when digital transformation works, it's because it's very holistic. Absolutely. So as much as we're talking about marketing, um, what you do in marketing is going to have a ripple effect, hopefully, to the other parts of the organization right. and vice versa, right? So you need to be a mindset shift in that way is to be more collaborative than ever before. So um, when I think about digital transformation and the way a lot of marketers I talk to have been talking to me about it and are thinking about it, I think about being a runner. And when you are at a race that's, you know, and you're not one of the 10 people at the front of the race. So if you're in the middle of the pack, like me, you need to run your own race. And the same is true with digital transformation. Um, if you get caught up in, yes, you need to be competitive. You can't be way behind your, your competitors in your industry, but you also need to do what's right for your organization and your customers and employees and at the pace that's right for you so that you're making smart decisions. So you know, with that in mind, what do marketers need to be doing in terms of benchmarking? Like, how much should they be looking at external data and how much should they be balancing that with looking at what's going on inside their organizations? Um, Scott? Sure, I think the um, interesting thing about this notion of, kind of the period that we're going through now and digital disruption in general is that businesses are being disrupted not just by their competitor, but by folks that don't compete with them whatsoever. Right? So my wife's frustration with the dentist that she couldn't make an appointment on her phone for was not because there's some other dentist that allows you to make an appointment on your phone, but because she can do everything else from her phone. Right. So there's this notion of com competition is not coming from traditional uh, competitors. So, you know, while the you're right to embrace at your own pace, um, but at the same time, pick it up, um, right? Because there's there's somebody else that's gonna do whatever it is that you do better and faster, and the notion of loyalty, um, it's there, but it's a heck of a lot harder to achieve, I think, these days. There's just always somebody ready to kind of pick up from you. So um, your core focus on what you do and do really well, you definitely need to innovate um, around that. Quickly. And the notion of benchmarking, I think, um, when you look at some, the interesting thing is that, I don't know why I keep referring to Forrester, I'm going to do it one more time. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm stop. Um, they have a notion of a customer experience index. Have you seen this before? It's a kind of ongoing um, piece of research they do, I think they publish every other quarter, uh, where they, they survey customers from 299, 300 companies that are across all industries, and they gather this index of, uh, of customer satisfaction, essentially, on, on those. And I think the interesting thing is these, co these companies all know very well that they're being surveyed. They all know very well this is going to be public. They all know they're being benchmarked against these others. Yet, if you look at like the last three revisions of this thing, you really haven't seen it's something like, I think, 2%. Like the map Masses, there's been like 60% have actually declined in, ex in their customer experience perception. 30% or so has been fairly even. 
and very little, 10, whatever the numbers are that you subtract there, um, have improved um, in any sort of a significant way. Even though you know you're being monitored, even though you're orienting your whole organization, and I think part of that is just the kind of carrot in front of the horse is that this the notion of kind of what a good experience is is constantly changing, expectations are constantly rising, um, and so I think it's it's really, you, you do have to constantly be evolving, and you shouldn't just be benchmarking against your traditional approach. Um, Alan, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I would say it's critical to benchmark both your employee, sort of where you are relative to your vision and your focus as an executive team, and is that matriculating down for your employee base? Are they buying that? Is there a sense of purpose? that you're providing them that they want to be a part of, because that's going to matriculate to the customer's experience. So very important to benchmark that. Also then very, very important to be out there regularly looking at the customer experience. And I know that's a, that's a word everybody's using right now, but there are various flavors of that depending on your target segments. So we know that younger demographics, whether we call them Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen X, we know that there are, you know, we, we have these sort of monikers for different generations and we all use them. But I think that we know that um, digital experiences that are frictionless, that, you know, back to your story of your wife, you know, right. the bar has been set very high for um, what a good digital experience should be. You should be able to press one and pay your phone bill. Um, and be done with it. And that's a very frictionless experience. If another vendor doesn't have that same level uh, of functionality, then a as was said, that's a, that's a bad user experience. So the bar's been set high. Conversely, while I might really enjoy calling an airline and, re and being addressed by my first name when they answer the phone and say, hi, Alan, how are you? If my mother, who's in her 80s, uh, were to call that same number and they were to say, Hi, Mr. Shulman, how are you? She would go, how'd you get my, how'd you know my name? How'd you, how'd you know them? So we have to recognize that good customer experience is defined differently by what we measure and benchmark by different segments. Because while I might be surprised and delighted by that experience, that use of data on a different demographic could be a negative customer experience. So it's risky to assume that digitization is uh, uh, is going to match every heuristic, or, or, or which is a word for human behavior, right? Every heuristic is different from segment to segment. So we have to think carefully about how we personalize, and I want to use that word, you know, rather than, you know, the transformation word, I think there are some things that digital transformations are getting anchored to. Ex customer experience is one, personalization is another, and direct marketers have been in the personalization business forever. We are the original personal, personalized marketers, it's just that we've evolved from Dear Allen to lots more sophisticated ways using data to personalize. I think the rest of marketing, which was very mass market focused, has now recognized what we have known for a very long time, which is that the more personalized that we can be, the better we, chance we have of, of creating an experience like the milkman or like the, the, the paper boy or like the person who you knew um, delivered you a personal experience. So I hope that answers your, your question on the benchmarks. And you make an interesting point too because just because you like the airline knowing who you are yes. doesn't mean that you want some other company that, to know who you are that you don't work with as frequently. So it makes the customer experience challenge even greater because you're a different demographic in Correct. or different persona Correct. depending on who you're doing business with and not just what you like in general. So and isn't it remarkable how CMOs used to be orchestrators of lots of ad agencies, right? And now that CMOs are responsible in many cases for total customer experience, they're now responsible for call center, which in many cases they were never responsible for. They're now responsible for retail experience, which they were never responsible for. And these are all new remits that the CMO has that isn't about what my paid media plan or what my campaign is gonna look like or how am I dividing up my dollar between mass reach, direct marketing, promotions, those types of things. So as we pivot to experience, it's a whole new challenge, I think, for the CMO. Absolutely. I have a 
what are you seeing, especially you know, in, in say financial services, of how marketers can benchmark change? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting and to build on what we've been talking about. There's kind of an intersection between data and experience, uh, microsegmentation, and it contributes also to a persona development. And here's a quick example: Royal Bank of Canada. Royal Bank of Scotland was doing this too. I mean, you could go back about 10 years, and Royal Bank of Scotland and Royal Bank of Canada, both of my clients of mine, could, could identify maybe five to 10 personas within their customer base. Now, because of micro segmentation, Royal Bank of Canada, for example, can identify 10,000 micro segments. So to your point about your mom, they will have a group that doesn't want their data right exposed. That they're very concerned about security. Uh, one of the examples that they doesn't want a digital experience. They don't want a digital experience at all. And this is one of the things, frankly, that's going on when you ask me about financial services. You know, and, and this is where employees come into play. One of the big trends that you see in financial services, I and mean, you can see it around you is to cut back in branches. One of the ways that banks are looking to save money is to close them, close them fast. Well, you go around the corner, TD Bank has a different point of view. They understand that the relationship is developed, built, and sustained at the branch level. And they can use data like the Royal Bank, Royal Bank of Canada does to personalize the experience. Now, there is a point of intersection between all of these data that that they have available and what the employees are able to use at the branch level or even you know even on the phone. Um, T Bank does it very well. I go back a number of years and I you know I, and I tell you about MBNA. This is what you know before uh, Bank of America bought MBNA, they were past masters of doing this kind of stuff. You could, you know, they didn't lose customers. They built customers up. They extended credit just based on, on the micro personas that they, that they had, that the, the individual customer service rep had at his or her fingertips. They were incredible. I used to take clients down into their buildings in Wilmington, Delaware to see exactly what was going on. It was phenomenal. And you can do that now, for example, at USAA Insurance and get the same kind of same kind of experience. The way employees interact with data and the way that they've been trained puts these guys at the top of the heap. Everybody else is kind of, a, you know, a lot of companies are, are followers rather than leaders here. This is not small. I mean, it's to your point, this is a never-ending, a never-ending enterprise. And it's, it's been impacting the banking and insurance sector, particularly banking because of fintech. But um, we see it in insurance, we see it in investments, we see it elsewhere. This is the point of intersection where employees and customers create together, create value for themselves, value for each other, uh, you know, and bottom line performance. Data is critical in all of this. I mean, you, you know, before, before the cost per byte keeps going down and down and down and down, makes these terabyte terabyte databases absolutely available. Mean, Walmart is, is known for this and having the world's largest database. The question is what are they doing with it? How are employees involved? And what's it doing to the culture? I would argue that Walmart may be, be doing more, but you can look at other organizations, again, like T Bank, Royal Bank of Canada, USAA, that's where they're doing it very well. So there are companies that have, have found what ticks and what works for them and there are companies that are still kind of trying to get there. One of the other articles that I brought with me is the guy who's the CMO at Fifth Third Bank, which is in Cincinnati. It's one of the big banks. And he says, look, the critical thing here in making digital transformation work is very clear. It's culture and people. And, and for me, and I'll make this brief, the missing link in all of this is not just marketing, and not sales, or customer support, or even leadership. It's bringing HR to the table, and making HR a partner in all of this, because that's when the magic happens. 
That's when the magic happens. And for companies that are succeeding with this, they've been able to do it. And, and HR understands its evolving role here. Uh, it, and again, it, 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 it all boils down to, I mean, all these elements are into the mix, but it ends up being what's the perceived value for the stakeholders, right? How's that, how's the culture helping to drive that? So digital transformation in, in the big picture is, is this huge, you know, overwhelming thing, right? And a lot of marketers and their colleagues get tripped up by where do we start? And ultimately, if you think about it, you're not going to sit down and fold up a whole pizza and try and eat it all at once, right? You're going to pull up a slice and maybe fold that in half or cut it up, right? And that's kind of how you break down your digital transformation. You need to prioritize and, and, and the like. And sometimes that starts with little tiny things. For example, um, I recently interviewed the um, head of customer interactions, basically, for Virgin Holidays. And they started with one thing, which was using AI for their to automate their, um, their email subject lines. And that worked so well that they then that they used Phrasee. And they brought in um, Movable Inc. to automate the email experience on open and start personalizing the emails based on where customers are traveling to and all this the weather and all this kind of stuff. And from that success, um, they added another piece and another piece, and then they, they put all of the customer communications through that group. It was all going so well. And so every everything built on the next thing, and every success, they were able to get a little bit more budget for the next bigger project and bigger project. And so my question, finally, <laughs> is um, you know, how important is getting that those those quick wins and how do you prioritize with there's you know so many things to do where can you start looking to to get your priorities in order so I think you put your finger right on it because this is you know if you're talking about direct response this is where it was born pilot testing beta testing you know you get you know I, I, those are lying <laughs> good move. You know, I mean, what happens is, you know, if you're if you're a marketer, if you're in sales, you're customer support, whatever you are in HR, you get X amount of time with senior executive in the company every quarter. What you want to be able to do is ask for a small budget, get a win, come back, build on it, pyramid it up. I love that because this, you know. There's something, there's something in, in project management called the horizon principle. Anybody ever heard of the horizon principle? It's one of the things that hurts IT so much. They try to go for everything at once. Let's transform the company. Let's have a big IT transformation and everything will be great and it very rarely works out. This is one of the reasons that a lot of these CRM programs a decade ago started to fail. Too much, too fast. We can do it. We, you know, we'll hire. We'll hire a company to come in and help us, and and the thing goes south, and maybe the salespeople don't like like the way things are run. They will rebel against it. Customer service won't like the way things are done with the new system. They'll rebel against it rather than building from the ground up, and getting and getting successes. Beta testing, incremental testing. Um, you know. Uh, 50 50 death. There are all kinds of ways to do it. Anybody who's in direct response understands this. There are a lot of different ways to slice this and dice this so that you can, so that it's managed. But I think that's for me, that's the that's the best way to do it. I think that's yeah. that's smart. I think I think that uh, agreed. I think that it, it's dangerous to um, to put the plumbing in front of the poetry of our business. <laughs> And, and I think that the seduction of technology and what it will solve, but we love data at Deloitte. It's our DNA, uh, numbers and, and data. We're, we're all about that. But at the end of the day, um, we're still in the people business. So it starts with uh, advising first and making second. And I think from that perspective, we start outside in as opposed to enterprise out. Outside in means you start with what is the experience you want to deliver to that customer. If you can define that and work your way in from customer to touch points, then into the enterprise, and then to what technology enables that, 
think what, to, to your point, where do you start? I think, you know, we sort of start at the customer always and start at defining what it is that the customer is looking for and move in. That isn't to say that we aren't involved in a tremendous number of enterprise level supply chain oriented transformations, but generally our perspective is to go outside in rather than from the inside out to the customer. And because the, the whole sort of you know, strategy from the outside in is sort of the premise from which we believe we're gonna get the best results. To your example that you gave, I think also as a creative, I, I somewhat bristle when I hear that because algorithms don't feel, people do. And I think when we start to think about technologies writing multi, but I don't think we're there yet. So uh, I'll go back to my quote and say um, uh, that algorithms don't feel, people do. And I think as long as we start outside in and shave off, if we can one moment in the journey and make small bets around that one moment and scrum in a sort of an agile sort of framework, for those of you familiar with agile meaning test and learn, test and learn, test and learn, if we can do that around small things and get quick wins, typically, you know, as, as a, I'll put my consultant hat on now and, and sort of instead of my creative hat and said, where there is low effort and high impact, that's where you start. Um, on, on quick wins is things that take low effort but have a high impact. And if, and if digital's involved there, those are the places that you'd probably want to start scrumming around. I just want to, um, three, three points. One is, just to be clear what we're talking about, I just came from Orlando this morning from an SAP conference, and where those guys talk about digital transformation, it's very different than what we're talking about here, right? So that's mm -hmm. like supply chain, like you said, yeah. logistics. I mean, there's serious transformation that is not at all owned by any CMO, you know, anywhere. Um, so I think we're talking here about digital experience transformation, maybe, or something like that, but anyway. Uh, second is, um, on the point that you made about AI, I, I tend to disagree. I think that it's starting to come um, a lot more advanced than just kind of automating easy processes. It is, if you know, most movie trailers are now made by AI. They, they, they ran uh, thousands and thousands of movies through machines and thousands and thousands of, of parallel um, trailers, which you would think is a very creative process through a machine, and then compare that to box office ratings, and now they have a whole process that within hours they create a movie trailer from thousands and thousands of hours of movie um, editing and movie um, film, essentially, they can go and create it. So that's a very creative process, something that took lots and lots of people many, many weeks, um, and now it's being done by AI. So it's not just automated traditional processes. But back to your point, sorry. The way that I would look at where to start, I think of um, I think of it as kind of like Mas are you familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yes. right? Where you don't care about kind of anything at the next level if something at a lower level is kind of is not being satisfied. I think about it as kind of like an experience hierarchy of needs, where you have kind of effective utility at the lowest level. Does it work? Does, can I, if I'm flying on it, which I do a lot, if I'm flying on an airline. Did my bags arrive? Am I able to check in? Can I, you know, did my, yeah, all of those sorts of things. All of the various experiences that you might have and interactions, do they work and then can I get them done? Can I get them accomplished? Second, beyond, if it's effective, the second kind of level of the, on the hierarchy is seamlessness. Was it easy? Was it not very hard for me to do that? Was it a, was it a decent experience? And I think the third level of the kind of top level, and by the way, you don't care about seamlessness if it doesn't work, right? If it's not effective, you don't care about a seamlessness at all. The third is the delight notion, right? Did you delight me? Did when I got on the plane, one of my favorite things as a Diamond Delta flyer is when they say, thank you for being a Diamond, Mr. as I'm boarding the plane. That is a very personal experience. It just touches my heart. I'll fly you for the next <laughs> six months because you said that to me once, right? Delight, however, is not very scalable, it's very difficult. That particular case that I gave is a bad example of that TD's bank notion of the machine, you've seen all seen the oh, YouTube yeah, yeah. videos spitting out the cool packages and stuff like that. That's not scalable and it's extremely expensive, right? Where I would spend my time on that hierarchy, the 60% of my projects and time and my focus would be on effectiveness. Can I make things that maybe don't work today work? 
right? Can I make sure that when somebody calls that the phone gets answered? Can I make sure that when they check in it always works? Can I make sure that their bags always arrive? Can I make sure that their transactions, their checkout process always works, that they get their packages, all of those things. If there's anything broken at the effectiveness level, who cares about anything else? 30% of my time would be making things easier, right? So better online experiences maybe, seamlessness, and then 10% at the kind of delight portion. You always want to put some of that. So you can work those in parallel, but that would be my breakup of where to focus. So it's interesting because you pretty much all mentioned make it easier to do business with, <coughs> with you as a company. Right? So a lot of these digital transformation projects come back to are you making it easier to do business with people? Because if not, you know, there's competitors who are more able to do that. Yeah, that's what Michael talked about perceived value, mm -hmm. That's what, and, and, and you know, the great, I love this Richard Branson story so much. Um, Virgin Airlines, of course, Richard Branson, very visionary guy. Um, he, knew, he knew that when, when kids were small in, in England, in the UK, they used to give out little, these little baby ice cream cones in the theaters between film rails called chalk ice. And he decided to give away free chalk ice on Virgin flights. Um, from London to New York, and it was that little sort of scalable 50 cent thing that he did that made people feel nostalgic for their childhood that drove incredible perceived value of the experience, more than any discount that he would offer yeah. versus British Airways. He tells that story of how just putting chalk ice, giving away free chalk ice um, to the passengers created preference because there was a high perceived value um, for that little tiny thing that we did around the customer experience. I think there are human elements like that 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 in his that, 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 that was something very personal that he that he sort of had the insight to do that was a differentiator for them more so than cutting the price. Well, and that's interesting too because then that shows as you're transforming you know, in marketing to have uh, more digital customer experiences where the traditional and the personal touch. The human and the digital balance, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. So let's talk about journey mapping now because that has come up over and over again. The article that I wrote was all over the place. Everyone was, was mentioning it. Um, you can't do digital transformation without mapping the customer journey. So why, you, why is that and is there place that you need to start because you can map you know, elements of the customer journey, you know, the service side, the marketing side, et cetera. Is, is there a sweet spot to start? Um, Alan, why don't you give us one? I, it's funny, you know, I think uh, a journey is a funnel light on its side. Um, and, and I think that, you know, in the old days we, we thought about the funnel you know, moving from awareness to consideration to purchase to loyalty, right? You, know, you think about a journey, you put, if you put the funnel on its side, really a journey is just sort of a new interpretation of what the funnel is about. It's just that we're now in the retention business once we, once we get that customer and we've got to use data to, you know, to keep cross-sell, off-sell, and maintain that customer experience. I know that sounds simplistic, mm -hmm. but I think that, um, as I said before, I, I think it, it's one thing to hypothesize a journey, what we have done at Deloitte is we've invested heavily um, in validating those journeys. So we bought a firm called LRA, which was a brand compliance firm based in Pennsylvania. They used to go out and actually look at whether employees were you know, wearing their uniform correctly, wearing their name tag correctly, were they brand compliant? Well, we re-engineered that offering around customer journeys and we're actually, as we hypothesize a customer journey, we actually send them out to validate, is the journey that we think this customer segment on, is it actually true? Because a lot of us can sit in a room and, and, and a, in a war room and hypothesize a customer journey, but how many of us can actually go out and validate it? And I think one of the great things I love, being a, having been a 30-year agency guy, now working in a place like Deloitte, is we actually have the resources to go out and validate a journey. And that's one of the things that is great from a creative director's perspective is that we actually can know when we're scrumming ideas in the journey that we validated that yes, that's actually what they do at that point. It takes a certain level of scale to do that. Yeah. I thought, 
I think what you're asking about when you're asking about journey mapping in the context of digital transformation is where is the journey now? We do an awful lot and we do it, uh, both customers and employees, separately and sometimes together, are involved <coughs> in what is fairly rigorous process. So we're trying to understand it's almost like a mirroring process. What do the employees think is going on relative to what the customer says is actually going on? And if you're going to move that into a digital program, or at least the, the foundation or the fundamentals of a digital program, it's like the old thing that you learned in, in Marketing Management 101 and doing a situation analysis. Where are you? You gotta know where you are before you start injecting components of where you want to go by putting digital into the customer experience and the employee experience. So you can then effectively make changes and chart what that experience is going to look like. We were talking about making things easy. That may be that may be useful, but you never know. I mean, there's been a lot, I'm involved in customer things, which you know, and, and there's been some ongoing dialogue about does making things easier or seamless really make things better for the customer? Well, maybe yes and maybe not so much. Again, it all depends upon how the customer sees the value of all of this. I, you know, if I have to put in more effort as a customer, and this is part of the journey, am I going to get more value out? If I put in less effort because things are being done, done for me digitally, super, but am I getting more value out of it? I have to be able to see that. Uh, again, you know, uh, some of this is emotional, and we track this very carefully as well. Um, we have an emotional hierarchy, actually, uh, which is a little bit different than Maslow's, but it's okay. It's been validated. I don't know, we're up to 75,000 respondents worldwide. I think that's pretty well. So you really have to understand from a journey perspective. I think in, you know, in CXBA they call it jobs to be done, jobs to be done comes into, you know, that, that helps to form personas. But you really then, but, but getting to the journey mapping is really where the dissection comes in. What do the components look like? How do they contribute to the whole? And where's the perceived value? And by the way, there's even a component which, which you, know, you alluded to. And that's brand impression. Brand impression is very important, extremely important. It's actually part of the experience. Even though you know it might be swamp gas to some people, not really, not to the employee, not to not to the employees, and not to the customers. It's very very critical because it, because it helps to shape reputation, and, and that helps to shape downstream behavior. Informal word of mouth comes into this. In any event, the whole notion of of uh, journey mapping, after you've done some initial research, can be absolutely critical, particularly if you're going to then move into the injection of more digital into the overall experience. You got to do it. <laughs> you have to do it. Um, to see, you know, again, where you are to where you think you want to go. And where you think you want to go is that going to be useful for the customers in terms of value and how are the employees going to respond to it. So uh, it, it's pretty, it's pretty multi -layered. So you do some gap analysis, it sounds like, and then if yeah. you Go back to what Alan was saying about taking the funnel and putting it on its side for, to create a customer journey. That's like the starting point, right? These days, it's, instead of being linear, it's more like a bubble it's pattern, all, it's right? All it's all over the place. Well, right? it is. Yeah, it's so. all over. And brand, at any point, what Michael was saying, any point in the journey, where does brand going to matter? Ever try to get Uber on the phone? Ever try to get Expedia on the phone? These brands matter at different points in the journey. People have a heuristic. They want to know that there's people behind the brand. And we've got the research to show that brands matter, that there's an enterprise there, that there's a back office, that there's people there, that I can get somebody on the phone if I have a problem. Now, we also have data to show that some younger, some younger segments don't care about that and are willing to forgive that. But there are points in the journey where brand absolutely matters, particularly when something goes wrong, yeah. right? And you want to know that you can get a human being on the other side. I think 
I, I like to um, think about customer journeys as basically like the the customer journey is actionable to me, right? The customer journey is like how can I how can I affect that? Really, it's kind of too too high for me. So I think it's and we've used this. We've talked about journeys. We've been talking about um, journey mapping. You're talking about the the customer journey is more like the customer life cycle, which is composed of a whole bunch of journeys underneath that, right? Which are basically interactions. If you think about what is customer experience, it's like a it's a holistic view of a brand based on lots and lots of interactions with that brand. Whether those interactions are actually personal interactions with them, or whether it's my interaction is I read about them in the paper, it's 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 that perception based on all of these interactions. And so I think the journey mapping is basically just taking each one of those interactions and saying, okay, what are the steps in that process? And then how can I affect them to make them more effective, more seamless, and delightful, right? So I think that um, it's helpful to think about it as a whole bunch of journeys. And, and um, I think if you can, journey mapping is a process because the notion of a marketer has evolved from, obviously you know this, I don't need to tell you this, but I'll, to state the obvious, you guys were all about just filling the funnel and trying to bring prospects and convert them, and now you have become like the customer advocate inside an organization that's trying to kind of shift from outside into inside out. So you've kind of become the general advocate internally, which means that now all of a sudden, all of these interactions that any customer has, regardless of whether they have anything to do with their buying process, somehow suddenly you own and you're responsible for. So I think journey mapping is taking parts of those or what are the ones that basically, what are the various interactions they have, whether it's picking up my bags or whether it's checking into the hotel and making sure that those things are as effective as possible. I used to work for Starwood Hotels back in the late 90s. I actually did a Y2K project. Um, there. Like I, was a, I was a Six Sigma black belt. They took on Six Sigma. They were, one of, they were like one of the first organizations that was a service organization to take on Six Sigma. And we had this notion of a defect as a black belt, which was kind of go and find the defects in the process, which is any kind of a breakdown and fix it, right? Um, and this is it's kind of very much the same thing, is go and find the defects and go fix them, or go find the, the things that could use to be improved and, and fix it. Whether that's make, digitizing it or not, just um, putting a little human touch in there. I think that's what we're kind of trying to do. Yeah, Deming used to call that chasing hot rabbits. You know, and the, and the fact is that you could, you know, it, it's like whack-a-mole. I mean, you can find the defect and correct it, but you know, you, then you have to go back. Uh, I've had this dialogue with retailers. Retailers will say, well, you know, here's what we've done to the checkout line. Yeah, but that's just the checkout line. What's going on in the, re you know, how does the rest of the experience that's retail get impacted by that? And, it, and I said, so, you know, that's like whack-a-mole. Oh, well, we don't look at that. We just look at the checkout line. Really? That's interesting. Then. You know, how do you know? How do you know what impact that's had on the overall experience or other components of the experience? The answer is they don't. So, you know, um, this is one of the ways that, frankly, that TQ has evolved, and and I think for the better, because now it's become a lot more holistic. Six Sigma black belts are still extremely relevant, but they're now now I think now more part of the mainstream. You know, it's I think it's a great point that you. It's, 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 Can I make one quick claim to fame? So how many of you have been offered orange juice at your like hotel stay in the morning when you go to breakfast? How many times did they come around to you with a carafe of OJ and offer it to you? So that was actually my Black Belt project oh. at Starwood in 1998. Uh, I ran my first Black Belt project was to figure out how to increase the revenue at breakfast <laughs> at Westin Hotels, which was a, a fairly new brand for them at the time. And um, basically, we did all this because it was a lot of waste and stuff in, in, in breakfast, and they weren't that popular. And so we figured out that if you put a put a carafe of OJ, which you charged for, along with a <laughs> bottomless cup of you know coffee, which was free rift balls, if they brought both of those, then you we saw tremendous improvements in revenue at breakfast at two hotels. Um, one of them was the Phoenician uh, hotel, in, in, and then they basically rolled that out through all of Starwood Hotels, and I am the reason that you're paying attention. Please use my button. Excellent. You're welcome. So, <laughs> anyone have some questions? Uh, just, uh, I'm curious, uh, Alan, particularly uh, hearing your point of view. I get the, you know, for going from B to B, uh, we were always jealous when we were judging Echo Awards because right. they had all the budgets, you know, in the B to C, you know, for 
for you know the prospect. But in, in essence, B two B has been figuring out personas for a long time, long time. And, and and executing on that. And now we get to the consumer. I get getting to five personas, ten personas, twelve personas. What do you, what do you, what is the purpose of getting to ten thousand personas? Oh. And how do you develop a creative to support? 10,000 personas. So is that what is that what's going on or is it just a, 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 an AI web chat script or what, what, what are, what's happening you know right to get with that 10,000 personas? Yeah I think there's a my personal view is there, there's a there's a point where you can segment yourself into a living um, even though we want to get to one to one mm -hmm. that everybody in this room you know in the age of what we're calling cognitive web right? have the data that everybody can get sort of a different segments message. Segments go away. Right, segments yeah. go I mean, away. There is no notion of a segment of one. They're always evolving. Yeah. Oh, correct. So so I think I think that there is some there's some risk if you're if you're a mass marketer and you're you know you've traditionally sold a one dollar candy bar and drug and you have fifty SKUs of those candy bars, it is inefficient for you to segment um, in, in, in that scenario, you're still going to be a TV advertiser. You're still going to need broad reach and lots of impressions. So the idea of becoming a one-to-one -one marketer is not going to be efficient, you know, for you in that case. So it, it's I think as much as we're in this transformation from one to many to one to some mm -hmm. to one to one, right? Or what some people have called people-based marketing. I, I think that is that's very exciting to contemplate yeah. what that looks like creatively. The challenge for us is how do we get to emotional creative at scale yeah. um, when each one of you gets a different message. And I think, you know, as I said before, will algorithms solve that, or will we have benches of copywriters filling this room <laughs> creating multivariate copy? And I think that question still remains to be answered. I think. There are pieces of the process, you know, back to what we were discussing earlier. I too saw the, the yeah. Sensei demo on the movie trailers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I think if the emotion's built into the assets already, it becomes easy for the algorithm to reconfigure the emotional assets. Yeah. If you don't start with the emotional material, yeah. then you've got to, you, you sort of have to still have to wait, find a way to create that. So um, I remember back in the old days when I, when I worked for a direct marketing agency, we spent as much time on the coupon copy as we did on the whole ad. Yeah. And why? Because yeah. the human behavior, most people choose, if we said literally, most people choose B, we, we'd see different results. We, we would like, you know, really, really spend a lot of time on the coupon copy. I, I come from the old hard knock school of retail copywriter worked on Sears in Chicago as a as a young copywriter when I, I'm aging myself now but but we, we did spend as much time on that so I think to your question I think we are in this exciting sort of flux to yeah, more personalized one-to-one -one. I think direct marketing has always had its roots in what do we know about the customer and what 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 can, how can we use that data to per, be, be as personalized as possible digital transformations role in that will largely look like automation, but as everyone on this panel has just said, you can't, uh, you have to factor for the human piece of it as well, not well, just the digital piece. Going over to the paid model, you know, yes. the paid ad, mm -hmm. I can definitely see 10,000 personas going into, you know, digital display and programmatic algorithm, you know, trying to understand when did it show this per particular person this ad or on a yeah. social platform or in a mobile situation. I, I get that part of it, but it just seems like still it's a lot of paths to manage. You know, I, to, 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 to the question that you, that you raised, and I, I want to address this in terms of what, what Royal Bank of Canada did and what Royal Bank of Scotland did and what their rationale was. And first of all, I agree with a lot of my marketing professor colleagues that, that trying to do any type of really tight, tight segmentation for FMCGs is just not nearly worth the effort. On the other hand, what, you know, I mean, I've worked with RBC, so their, their rationale for it was, you know, they got, they got people, let's say, who, who uh, uh, are Alan's mother's age, who might be living you know, for most of the year in Toronto, or autumn, or or you know Montreal, 
but they winter in Florida. In, in, you know, in the red in the redneck Riviera or or somewhere in Florida. And that might be a very small segment. So whatever promotions, whatever communications, whatever interactions that they have in the panhandle or you know outside of Miami Beach with these people when they go south for the winter, you know, and Snowbird. This is the way they want to be able to control. The fact is, it's not necessarily that you ought to do it, but the fact that you can do it, and they've seen increases in perceived value first, and per customer revenue. So as long as they've seen that, and go back to what we were talking about before, they didn't just come to this and say, hey, we can do 10,000 segments, let's do it. They beta tested, they pilot tested, they built, they built, they built, they built, they built. They built. So this is several iterations, and they've now got to the point of saying, yeah, we can, not only can we do this, but we can sustain it, we can increase share of customer, right? And that's what RBC has done. Um, so from their perspective, and they're looking at it totally, you know, can we manage it from the business perspective, culturally, and with employees as well, they said, bottom line is yes, they can do it, so they did. So they did. I think it's a great question because you know why do you do it otherwise? You just don't. You just don't do it because you, you know because you can. You do it because there is a there is a business benefit, and it has to be a strategic business benefit. It has to be long term. It has to support the brand and the brand perception, the brand image. It has to support every. All of these things have to kind of go in tandem, and all of it. You know, again, it's a demi thing. What gets measured gets done, and and they could measure it. They could see it. They could, they could you know, see the results. But, but I think, be, be clear that um, a lot of people think that AI is just too far fetched, so it's not going to go there. It, it is quickly. It um, is. Oh, yeah. I come from a web content manager background, fast. and the biggest struggle that most of my clients have is we help, to help them with personalization, and now they have zero idea how they're going to fill all that those content needs. Now, if you were before you had one piece of content, now you want to personalize it, that means you need that times 10 or times however many, right? impossible to, to, to do today. But things like, Alan, you mentioned natural language generation. I, anybody play fantasy sports? I play fantasy football, right? And so I use CBS, I think, for my fantasy football team. And every week after the game, I mean, how about after the draft? I got this email that basically said how I performed in the draft. The damn thing was talking trash at me. Like, it, it, said, it, it said, like, um, you know, you got to be. Okay, I'm thinking that's not bad. But it's, it's like, you know, but you made the worst pick in the draft here. And so-and-so is going to kill you on week six because of this stupid decision you made in round three. And, like, it's, so it was really natural sounding. And that was generated by a computer for, you know, times however many millions of people play those things. Like, that's real deal. Um, so maybe it's that it knows that you're from the South and it starts to throw in the word reckon. I don't know what it does, but um, but I think that it will be able to cater to 10,000 different personas based on your needs or sprinkle in some product references that you've purchased in the past or whatever it is, but content is really gonna be able to explode with it. Now, be real though, 99% of companies today can't make use of AI because they don't have the data to be able to make use of AI. Right. You have to have a tremendous amount of data to be able to, right, for it to learn enough. But um, it will come, um, and not too, too far from now. And I think in the stepwise, right, is think about, I can't even name the ice cream chain that has like the handful of ice cream flavors and the whole bunch of mixins. And you can go in and- stone. Cold stone, yeah, right? You can kind of customize your, personalize <laughs> right. your ice cream based on the set mm -hmm. mix. Yeah. So I think in the meantime, are using a little bit of that. We've got you know these yep. things, and we're just, we're going to serve them up yeah. as as uh, needed. But Ray, you had a question. Yeah, uh, a lot of the companies you spoke about this evening are pretty big powerhouses. If we would define startups, maybe of four years or less. They've had the benefit of not a lot of silos, uh, a lot of new technology at their fingertips, uh, a staff that's a, you know, adept at how to use these platforms, etc. I understand the journey never ends with the slide it just shows, but are they going to get there in Europe any faster because of they just have four years and less under their belt and that's actually an advantage versus some of those very large organizations that have to essentially reinvent themselves? 
Scale is less, scale is, you know, interesting, scale is less important if you have some resources to do it than the intent and the leadership of management. Up your way, you have Zane Cycles in, in Connecticut. You may have heard of him. Yeah. And Zane Cycles has been able to do this. Now, that's a small company, a very small company. And yet, they've been able to do it. You know, well. What I, what I would say, sorry, did I? Did no, 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 no. What I would say is they have agility yeah. and they don't have friction in their in their organizations. So they're able to pivot quickly around the things that differentiate on customer experience, like content, like you know the, the way that they can test and learn quickly based on offers, all the things that they can do in a very rapid way that gives them learnings faster than, than the bigger ones. For those of you who haven't seen the IAB's report on 21st century direct to consumer, uh, uh, the direct to consumer movement, I highly recommend you download it. it. Really doesn't have a whole lot to do with interactive advertising, but it's a tremendous study that was released recently on on what are those. To your point, what are the direct to consumer startups that are nibbling away at the big guys? You know, we all use Dollar Shave Club and others as the example of what that looks like. I think. Getting to a certain level of scale is what they'll have the ability to do. The question is, is their purpose at some level of scale to be acquired, or is their purpose to go beyond and get to scale? And I think that what we've seen of the, of the sort of the, the, the complexion of those cultures is they're looking for, they're looking for a cash out um, at, at, at certain point, at a certain point. And I think that's where you know, building sustainable brands and power brands, as the big guys call them, that's a very different uh, endeavor than reaching a certain level of scale and then flipping for a multiple. So I, I think, to your point, very, very intrigued by many of these brands, and we've all seen them and, you know, love the Warby Parkers of the world and some of the things that, that those brands are starting to do and really nibbling away at their categories. But uh, I would highly recommend you guys download that IAB study, the 21st Century Direct to Consumer Report. It's on the IAB site. I think they don't have legacy mindset and they don't have legacy technology. Right. right. In both cases, right? So there's no niche, there's no notion of digital transformation if you're starting from scratch digitally, right? Almost, right? From, from that standpoint. And then from a the mindset standpoint, organizational change is a heck of a lot easier. You're creating the culture from the outset. And so you can build on that basis. I think there's I think both of those are the two kind of biggest challenges typically that most larger brands face. So yeah. yeah. I mean if you if you take what the sort of the that you're making about today's world and fast forward let's say ten years and think about loyalty and brand and what it means to the generation that's gonna actually be flush with more money to spend because of the this is the generation that's growing up with cell phones. You know, they didn't know about cell phones. Ten years ago, we barely had the iPhone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's a lot will, of change. Uh, how will the sort of landscape change if, if you could, you know, look ahead because of this transformation that you're talking about, which to them is nothing but their, you know, their daily world. Yeah. I mean, the first of all, the I mean, the expectations just go off the chart, right, from the standpoint of the customer. I mean, I, at home, we've I've just had the advantage, kind of much like a younger company has, of just basically rebuilding my house. So we've just bought a new house and completely leveled it and started anew. And everything, it's like, I feel like I remember reading an article about Bill Gates about 15 years ago about how everything in this, he walked into a room and it changed color for you and all that. It's not quite that way for us, but <laughs> Alexa's throughout, I don't buy anything that I can't control that way. You know, whether it's from ring to how I operate my garage door to my sprinklers going on, I can set them right now. Like everything is all. So the notion of voice, the notion of all of these interfaces that are not even interfaces anymore. They're, they're just like everything changes. So I don't even know what happens in 10 years. I mean, like I said, literally it was in 2007 when the iPhone was at first invented. So that was only 11 years ago. What's 10 years from now? I mean, are just, it, it's, what, what's the, who's the law? What's the, uh, it's not Murphy's law, but what's the law that talks about the kind of accelerating rate of pace of change in this space? I, I honestly don't even know, but I do think AI will have much more impact than today. I do think, yes, the marketer's role changes vastly. Certainly you need more strategic marketers, yes, 
But you're going to need a lot less kind of Indians um, to be honest with you. I think a lot of the role of people changes in a, in a very, very drastic way. Um, there's not as much content creation. I think that starts to get done a lot more naturally. I think, I mean, a lot of things change and you really, we probably will be at the point of one-to-one -one, um, in a pretty significant way within, in 10 years. I, I so, don't think that's beyond the realm of, of possible at all. I know a couple of other people have questions. We have the room until 8 o'clock. There's still food and booze, most importantly. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, Scott, Michael, and Alan so much for coming and sharing their insight with us. And um, with that, and thanks to all of you for being here. And thanks to our sponsors for making it happen. Thank you. Thank you thank guys for having me. Is now when we're supposed to start drinking? <laughs>